Okay. Good morning from Lagos, Nigeria here. I welcome you all to this um, session of this panel where we'll be looking at um, um, clean some cryptocurrencies. Um, I'm sure cryptocurrency, when we mention the name cryptocurrency, um, it's not something that new uh, in the ecosystem. Um, look at the impact, the impact of it on both on the world economy, um, both on the individual. I mean, think of it, it's not something that, um, um, it's something that I've, I've really um, changed a whole lot of things, you know. Um, as you may know, uh, blockchain technologies, you know, aims to transform the um, the current financial system, um, of course, and exclude the, the mediators um, and this fact that can be unnoticed by government, okay? Um, if you look at it in the beginning, cryptocurrency seems to be a doubtful scheme. Um, now, many financial giants should blockchain, cryptocurrency can be successful, successfully used in the, um, in the bank system, okay? And now, today, we will be looking at um, um, how this cryptocurrency, okay, how we can guide their true value, okay? If we look at it, if you look from, if you put fair together and you put cryptocurrency together, we will notice that um, cryptocurrency has resist being devalued over the time, like fiat that we you know, keep um, the, um, the value time to time. But cryptocurrency, at the same time, we know that it can be stolen, especially in the last um, um, few months. Let me see. I, I wouldn't say two years now. Maybe just a few months since last year um, when they, we've, we've um, entered the DeFi era, okay? Uh, we see a lot of rock pool, a lot of scam, a lot of um, wallets, um, non custodial wallets being hijacked, a whole lot of things. Okay? So, now, what we are looking at is that how may we guide the true value of cryptocurrency? Okay? And how does guide our investment? Who might be the trusted supra guardians? Could this be done semi automatically by big institutional investors? So these are the things that we'll be looking at today. Um, my name is Abiodun Ayorindi. I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. I manage a company called Leptix Technologies, where we engage uh, from the private sector um, to the public sector on the use of blockchain and how they can facilitate, okay? We bring adoption into the ecosystem as well in Africa. We engage the government on how they can leverage on blockchain, not just cryptocurrency only, blockchain for, for good. You know, um, we've been doing that for the, for the last four years. And aside that, I have other um, startups that I consult for, I manage, you know, um, developing stuff on blockchain. So that's what I've been doing for the past four years now. Um, beside that, um, I developed two as well. I'm in the ecosystem. Um, I code, I do stuff, and I speak everything around blockchain. Okay? So, this morning, we have, um, um, I will say, the experts in the ecosystem that understand from the front end to the back end to everything that you want to talk about on blockchain. Um, these are the people of years of experience. These are experts. They, they don't just talk, they do. They understand their onions. Um, they run business successfully. Not just, even before blockchain, they've been doing business successfully. They've launched a number of um, startups. They have patent when it talks of patents so to some of, some of the inventions. So these are the people that understand the, when we speak about blockchain, we speak about cryptocurrency, they understand it, they are not just novice. Um, I'm happy to, to introduce the panel to you. Um, I'll be speaking 
I'll be calling up on them to introduce them. Left. They are known into the ecosystem. They are known into the show. They run the show. They understand the show very well. So this morning, um, I will be calling. Um, um, we have about three of them, but presently now, I like will pick on um, Lance Morgan, the president and co-founder of Blockchain Intelligence Group Canada, to introduce himself. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Lance, as he was... Uh, 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 has mentioned, and uh, I'm the co-founder of Blockchain Intelligence Group and president. Uh, we're a company uh, headquartered here in Vancouver, British Columbia. We've now been in business for just over six and a half years. Uh, and um, we initially started with letting the industry know that we had the ability to look into cryptocurrency transactions. Uh, <clears throat> law enforcement was our biggest respondent, so that's how we were to focus our attention initially. And as we went down the road, we realized that we also have the data to deliver on uh, financial solution. So the risk scoring of addresses and transactions. Uh, we also do have a, a forensics division. So we do hear about quite a few different cases, which I'll, I'll get into some of them here shortly. Uh, <clears throat> and as we were traveling the world, um, both in panels and conferences, uh, we realized that education was something that was necess a necess necessity. And uh, so we do have uh, an online training program as well that helps people um, get an understanding of what cryptocurrencies are about uh, and, um, and then be able to actually uh, understand how to investigate them. And um, we are um, right now servicing clients globally. Uh, and um, I'm, uh, I'm proud to be here. Thank you for, for having me. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and the next person that I'll be calling on um, to introduce himself is someone that is not new to the ecosystem. Um, Dave J. Javans, please introduce yourself, sir. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Dave Jevons. I'm CEO of CypherTrace. We are one of the world's leading uh, blockchain intelligence and analytics companies. So we work with uh, customers in 37 countries around the world, financial institutions, cryptocurrency companies themselves like Binance and others, and government agencies in the regulatory and law enforcement world. So we provide a full suite of solutions for all of these different companies to provide security, analytics, regulatory compliance, particularly anti-money laundering controls and counter-terrorist financing controls for a wide variety of cryptocurrencies. And we work to integrate that into the full financial system. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, to take us for that, um, let, me go, let me go back to Lance now. So, um, Cryptocurrency payments have the potential of creating a more borderless, um, globalized economy, as well as fighting financial inequality by bringing fast and secure financial services to people without access to bank. Okay. However, however, incidents of digital asset theft has become a common one. I mean, um, as far back as, as, we, as we can remember, okay? Giving rise to the concern on how to guide its true value. I will put this question to you, Lance. Do you envisage the advent of a progressive technology that will mitigate risk and combat security holes in the complicated yet a lucrative world of cryptocurrency. Hey, well, when looking at Bitcoin, Ethereum, <clears throat> Litecoin, and, uh, and their underlying technology being blockchain, uh, the security itself has never been compromised. Uh, the thefts that have occurred are from other security flaws, uh, such as um, company employees sending their private keys across unsecured channels, and therefore it was exposed 
or people downloading a paper wallet uh, and the website happened to be compromised and therefore the key um, was known by the website provider. Um, or other instances, uh, a Trezor wallet was purchased on Amazon, um, but the, the, the package was compromised before it was reshipped. Um, and of course, there's the more traditional uh, cyber attacks where firewalls have allowed a piece of code to be installed um, which then allows to gain access to a file that or files that have had uh, private keys. Um, other things such as uh, employees, which we've heard have picked up USB sticks, which have malicious code running on it, and then uh, their their infrastructure has been compromised. Um, and uh, there's many things that, I mean, that we've seen throughout um, our time. Um, other things that companies don't mandate that their employees use company laptops or um, that the uh, uh, the employee was using a company laptop but still used it for non-work um, activities. Uh, you know, we do provide, as I mentioned, forensics for different um, uh, companies, individuals, and um, you know, their private keys have been stolen. Uh, we've seen instances where uh, someone needs help with their uh, moving funds from their wallet and they will contact a, a computer security firm um, thinking that, that they can be trusted. And as soon as the person has access to their private key, uh, they, uh, they then take the funds and, uh, and run away um, and, and steal them. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, there's also the instances where companies are providing uh, trading services or, or custodians and um, and their clients uh, could be culprits in some cases. Um, the example would be Quadriga and the 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 owner of uh, of that company. He was the only person in his company that he allowed to have a private key, and um, he theoretically he passed away. But uh, with one hundred and seventy million dollars, um, he could very well be uh, in another in another country. Um, and uh, there's also been many internal cases where it's not the owner of the company, but the employees of the, of the company have had access to uh, the systems where the private keys were stored. And therefore, um, there was enough money to where the temptation won them over and, uh, and they, they stole uh, the funds. Um, <clears throat> when looking at uh, some of the other things that have been created in, you know, late 2017 or mid 2017 ICOs where um, the developers would write extra lines of code to where more coins were issued than uh, what was thought to be minted. And um, so they also, uh, in that instance, at the end of the day, created theft. Um, so to answer your question, will there be technology coming that, that could mitigate risk and combat security holes? Uh, well, services such as what CypherTrace and Blockchain Intelligence Group offers. Um, someone that's before sending funds could look at a wallet to know if it's been involved in any type of nefarious activity um, and um, and protect themselves from sending it off to an address that's involved in a scam. Um, so those services like ours do help protect and, and help this industry grow. Uh, <clears throat> and there's there's different types of protection. Um, as, I, as I stated earlier, but as the industry matures, you know, other measures will come, increased regulation, um, require uh, companies to prove that they've gone through security audits and that ongoing audits are taking place. Um, countries like Japan require their VASPs to um, provide individual wallets for each of the customers so that it can reduce the amount of uh, of theft at one point in time that could take place. Uh, you know, there, there isn't going to be a silver bullet that solves all the problems here uh, that we've seen over the last decade. Um, but between internal policies, tightened security, reg regulation, uh, and education, uh, I believe things um, will become more safe as time goes on. I mean, we have seen uh, the overall criminal activity uh, going down, but it's also, I think, because of the overall adoption by the industry itself. You know, there's more and more users coming into the ecosystem every day. Um, so that does help push the percentages down. 
so with that said, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dave for some, maybe some insights as well, because he's of course seen just as much as I've seen. would love to know what his thoughts are. Okay. Oh, wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, I think off reason there was a project that was launching kind of a day five projects. Um, uh, someone that, um, I mean, I've, I've been a, I've always been a backend developer so for, for some years. So I just quickly go through their GitHub to look at the code. Um, um, to my surprise, I could see that, um, of course, they said that the, everything is going to be, the, the initial liquidity will be locked, but there's something more to that. I mean, it means that um, there was a code, you know, being written that, um, um, you know, when you are when you are transacting, there's a slippage. You know, there's number of uh, maybe between 0.5 to 1 percent, 5 percent, and so on. So from slippage, they make money. You know, so in case they use more, which meant the remaining is supposed to go to the liquidity, so it's going to the owner's account. And apart from that, the um, there's a way the code is being written that except the the first initial liquidity, every other liquidity can be drained by the owner. You know, so and some of these loopholes, you know, like you said, we need to look into that very um, critically. So um, some bad actors doesn't make the ecosystem look bad. You know, they are bad actors. The ecosystem is very good, but because of their um, the way they manage and they, they interact on the protocol, you know, it seems to make the ecosystem bad. Okay. Thank you, sir. So I will be calling on... Um, um, Dave now, um, if, um, if I may ask Dave, the recent upsurge, okay, um, upsurge in the value of um, cryptocurrencies, um, I've established cryptocurrency as a viable investment, which were the positive hype surrounding the blockchain technology that's backed up. Um, can we have a positive impact on the practice of institutional investors worldwide? Since cryptocurrencies are virtual and decentralized assets, are investors entirely responsible for guiding their, va their true value? Or could this be done, um, like I said, um, like semi-automatically by big investors, if I may ask Dave. Yeah, certainly the we've seen a lot of uh, the big investment firms moving into the market to provide cryptocurrency services. The, um, you know, certainly the big exchanges are a good place to initially look to house your cryptocurrency. So whether it's Coinbase went public in the last few months in the United States or one of the other international exchanges, those are good places to look at potentially housing some of your cryptocurrency assets. But the big financial institutions are also making moves in this area. So you'll see Bank of New York, Mellon, for example, the biggest custodian in the world is moving into providing cryptocurrency custody of assets. Um, and we'll see increased maturity of the market. So there's certainly a lot of opportunity to leverage big companies that have security programs that have insurance uh, or self-insure in case they get hacked. Um, the beauty of crypto is of course, you can always manage it yourself. So you can keep it on your computer, you can keep it on your phone, you can keep it on a hardware wallet. Um, but there are of course, more and more big companies moving into the market that will help you as far as uh, managing all your assets, applying security and regulatory controls. Okay. Um, do you have any addition to that, um, um, Lance? Yeah, well, I do uh, in the sense that, I mean, people are now, if they aren't leaving it in the big institutions, such as uh, what uh, Dave mentioned, um, they are their own bank. Right? Everyone is now um, essentially their, their, own, their own bank. So they do need to educate themselves on what is needed to protect themselves. What are those different options in the on the hardware wallet side of things, how do you uh, ensure that you've got a backup copy of 
um, either the mnemonic phrase or your private key so that you can uh, give yourself as much protection when you are the gatekeeper and the key holder. Um, you know, it's uh, some of them are simply managed by just logging with a username and password, but other, you know, the, a lot of these wallets are 16 to 22 more characters and numbers and letters. And uh, unless you're, uh, you've got photographic memory, you're not going to remember those things. So, you know, you need to make sure you save it in a safe place, put it in a safety deposit box. If it's a, a mnemonic phrase or, or a private key. Um, and um, so again, it, it just comes down to education. I think these larger institutions are going to um, take care of the people that are new into the industry and, and fresh in, in, in buying cryptocurrency. Um, but as time goes and depending upon how much you hold, um, you might still want to take that responsibility onto yourself rather than leaving it uh, in one of these uh, financial organizations that could be compromised again from an internal employee or, or uh, weak security protocols, um, those kinds of things. So, um, yeah, that's what I have to put in. You're on mute. Okay, thank you. So I, I, I'm saying that I would like to put, um, there's a question I would like to um, ask, ask Dave. As someone that has had um, over 20 years of experience in the security and payment market. Um, sorry to David, um, David Jevons. Okay, so the, the question now, is that um, um, cryptocurrency is uniquely positioned at the apex of technology and finance, having been um, lauded as a potential game changer, as the world moves toward a cashless society, um, the payment system around us is transforming to a digital economy. So if cryptocurrency is here to stay, okay, um, at least for a, for the foreseeable future. So the question becomes, I know that um, um, the, the core, one of the core value of um, digitalization, blockchain is ability to own this stuff to yourself, okay? But for example, in the case of um, 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 accident, death, um, you know, in banking, you always have, um, um, in, let me say, in financial institution, you always have, um, um, not third party now, um, someone like, um, um, in case you are no more that you can will your stuff to. So, in this case, do you think that, um, we need some, um, it, it will get to a point that um, people will be able to um, um, willingly give out their, maybe their um, private key or anything to um, institution to manage in such a way that maybe in case of a debt or anything that they couldn't operate, that they can reach out to the family members or they can, you know, Put it in the wheel. Do you foresee something like that? You know that can happen, or, you know, happen in the future. Or once the person is no more, the fund is gone and everything is gone. Or should we say that this is just part of the um, um, part of the? I mean, the problems. Well, if or you keep it, if you if you keep your funds hosted at a at a wallet provider, uh, you know, an exchange. And it's not a problem. It's the same as having it at a bank. You just have to have someone who's able to contact them and get access to your account. If you're managing it yourself, then yeah, there's simple ways to do it today. There's companies that are trying to build systems that are more complicated to manage it. But I mean, the simple thing is write down your recovery phrase like Lance was talking about and, you know, 
cut it in half, a piece of paper, and put one in one safe deposit box and one in the other and give your lawyers, you know, access to one or one or the other, and then you're done. It's real easy. You can do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, awesome. So what, what do you have to say um, um, to that? Myself? Uh, yes, Lance, yes. What do you have well, to say to that? I mean, I think Dave hit the nail on the head. There are ways. Uh, there are even certain custodians now that um, have escape hatches built in. So if you had more than one signature, signatory, um, or you lost your private key, it can be built into the code that um, if something was to occur, you can execute to where uh, it will then flush the funds to another wallet. Um, which then could be held in trust by your lawyer uh, or it could be held by another family member uh, <clears throat> so that you can alleviate um, certain instances. I mean, larger institutions or um, fund managers, these kinds of things, that, uh, or even confiscated funds for, for, for law enforcement. Um, they want to know that it's there, but if, if somebody was to um, pass away um, and a, a private key went with that person, um, these types of custodian providers can have a solution to alleviate uh, disaster um, and be able to to move those funds by execution of a of a smart contract. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's the sophisticated way to do it. The way I do it, it's real simple. I write down my recovery phrase. I cut the piece of paper in half. I have one in my fireproof safe at home, and I have one with our lawyers on the you know that manage our state. So if I were to pass away, then they would be able to. You know, take the piece of paper that they have and the piece of paper that we have, put them together, and then, you know, my family can get the funds. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. Because, um, you know, it's, it's like um, silent, um, you know, that most people are not really looking at. They are not, um, of course, nobody is thinking of um, death immediately, but I mean, it's something that they should look at in case um, uh, such thing happens so they can, they could. Something like a uh, staff have been put in place to um, to manage such um, fund or resources. So um, there's this last question uh, I would like to um, ask. I will just throw it open, okay? Um, for decades, um, I mean, fiat currency um, was the primary mode of um, tra of transaction which is exchange value being determined by the government of uh, respective countries. Um, cryptocurrency, however, like I said, you know, uh, resist being devalued over time, unlike VIAT, um, and, and were originally developed to provide a um, more alternative mode of payment for um, online transaction. Even though the blockchain technology that power cryptocurrency is um, known for its security advantages, um, its main risks are related to the security issues and um, a high um, volatility of a currency. Um, if you study between um, last month and this month, we witnessed some plumb in the crypto, you know, on the um, Bitcoin and on that ecosystem. Um, so, um, the question that I want to put to you is that in the light of this, how does cryptocurrency investors stay afloat, you know, all through the cryptocurrency roller, roller coaster? Um, I would, I, so anybody can pick this. I'll start. Okay. Values aren't set by governments. They set by, they're set by foreign currency traders. So the FX market set the values, if you will, of various currencies. That drifts all the time, every day. There's a full worldwide uh, exchange market for currencies all the time. And their relative values, as I said, are set by who wants to pay what for, for what. And that's just how it is. And cryptocurrency is no different. The difference is that it looks like a blend of that and the stock market speculative stock market. And those, again, those values are set by people. So if you can't afford to um, participate, you can't afford to lose money, then it's not a safe bet for you. Now, if you want to, I mean, it just isn't. If you want to use it for moving money around, use so-called stable coins and 
then you have a much more stable peg. Again, they're not 100% peg to the dollar or the yen or the euro, but they're pretty close. But that's true anytime anyway. And if I move money from the United States to Europe, I have to pay transaction fees and I have to pay um, exchange rates and they're set by my bank and they make money on it. And there's no difference in crypto. It's the exact same thing. It's just more volatile. Yeah, if you if you want to stay um, and hedge inflation, which we're of course seeing in these pandemic times, uh, certain cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin, being that it's capped at twenty one million, has um, some advantages to it, and uh, others like Ethereum, which is a utility, um, can can definitely um, be one that could be rewarding as the industry grows. I mean, this is still very early days uh, in in the overall development of this new financial ecosystem. Um, how do they stay afloat? Well, it's, uh, you know, if you look at a very uh, macro level, it's, it's, it's quite a bumpy ride. But if you scroll back on the graph and, and look at things, um, it's uh, forever slowly cry- climbing. Uh, and, uh, but um, you've got to have sort of a strong heart. And I agree with Dave in the sense that it's, it, 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 should be treated somewhat like a stock if you're if you're buying in the traditional cryptos versus a stable coin because it is not pegged to um, a dollar and instead more of a of a perceived value. Um, its overall objective in in the ecosystem is it a is it a payment mechanism? Is it a utility? Um, and so, looking at those, you'll know and understand um, how it and what kind of role it has in the overall. Uh, ecosystem again. The advantage of obviously besides um, some reduced fees is much quicker transaction time. It does allow to bank the um, two billion unbanked that are on the planet. Um, so it, it definitely opens up. And I think uh, as as more people become aware of it, I mean, a few years ago you couldn't find somebody that could tell you the difference, or I'd say forty fifty percent of the population to tell you the difference between cryptocurrency, blockchain, um, and DLT. Uh, but as time goes, more and more people are hearing about these things. More education is occurring through uh, mainstream media and uh, more institutions are getting the awareness out there and making those on ramps a lot easier for people to get involved so that they don't have to um, remember those private keys or have mnemonic phrases to be able to access their wallet. Um, but uh, it is it is something that is, is shouldn't be taken lightly and that, that there is still risk. Um, it depends on how long you want to uh, keep your money in there. Uh, there's a term of HODL, which stands for hold on for dear life. And uh, so if you're, if you're been in it since uh, 2016, like myself, um, wrote it up, wrote it down, wrote it back up, wrote it back down. But I have uh, strong beliefs in where, where this is going and how it's going to impact everything that uh, um we interact with and more and more retailers are coming online, which makes it easier to use and, uh, and not have to convert back to uh, another type of currency in order to, to be able to use it. Now, Abiel, you're on the ground in Nigeria. I'm interested in your perspective on what the central bank of Nigeria is doing in your country about restrictions on virtual currencies. There was, you know, in February, there was a letter that came out saying you shouldn't bank cryptocurrency companies. And there was a lot of, um, closure of accounts and tracking of that. And then there was a statement that was put out um, about 10 days ago where the Central Bank of Nigeria tried to clarify its statements and said, well, we're not really telling you to shut it down. We're just trying to do um, protection of the consumer um, against scams and things like that. So what's actually happening in Nigeria right now? seems like it's a hotbed of activity. Wow, awesome, awesome. Um, I will say that there's no framework for now. Um, approved framework to manage um, how we should transact when it comes to um, cryptocurrency. Of course, we have, um, um, when it comes to blockchain, um, for like um, two years now, we've engaged the CBN on, you know, developing sandbox with them and how the financial institution can leverage on blockchain as it is, which is well accepted. But the issue of cryptocurrency, you know, um, the truth is that um, government 
their key responsibility is to uh, is to be able to guide the citizen and to make sure that they don't lose their fun, their money. Okay, so in doing so, I think we need to come to um, in Nigeria. We need to come to the point of regulating cryptocurrency because it's going to be to our advantage. Advantages, you know. The reason um, that we need to do that very fast is that either the government like it or not, if you check the amount of um, funds coming to the ecosystem from Nigeria, Africa, I mean, it's something that a government can tap into, okay? Um, they can benefit from that. So a lot of transaction is going on when it comes to cryptocurrency, but um, um, government is it's not too, they are still thinking of it, okay? Um, this thing, the, because of the, 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 the nature of a cryptocurrency, you know, um, the being volatile in nature. So that is the area. I think that is the fear of um, um, federal government, um, the CBN. Um, but um, I think they, they didn't undo the issue that happened February when they started um, clapping down on accounts, um, um, closing down the accounts, people that are trading, uh, people that um, they need to. So for me, I think they just need to leverage on what is happening in the ecosystem, especially of the population of Nigeria. We have um, um, numbers of youths you know, online that um, um, making living from me, from, from doing that, from trading, from doing a whole lot of stuff. So presently in Nigeria, I would say there's no framework to manage how to utilize cryptocurrency, um, either to classify it as a, um, to either as illegal um, uh, stuff or or just as a utility tokens. There's not framework. How is that going to get better so if the government's banning Twitter? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> We're all here together. May as well ask the questions. <laughs> well, you are putting me on spotlight, man. Okay. Um, I want to hear from you. there, so right? Me. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. There's nothing to hide about the government banning Twitter. Um, even though I've refused to comment on that, um, um, I still tweet and I'm still going to sure. tweet. Okay, because um, my residency is not limited to Nigeria. Okay, yeah. so um, I have the, um, I have that um, that covering to do that. So they banned Twitter because presidency accounts um, stated some things that um, um, some people see it as a um, they violated the rule of Twitter. You know, when, gov when President Buhari was referring to what happened during the genocide, you know, tr during the um, um, war that happened in Nigeria, you know, referring to that, that um, they can use the same method um, to treat anyone that's um, trying to undermine um, the government. So people see it as, no, as the government don't need to come through that. You should be able to um, manage. That's why you are the leader. That's why you are the number one in the country. You're able to manage the emotion, manage the people collectively. And they reported that tweet. And tweet, um, and the Twitter, I mean, um, took it down. So um, it's like... So then he decided to take down Twitter for his entire country then. Yeah, I think uh, nice. that's... Yeah, that, that's not too good. That's not too good for a country where we have a lot of um, ethnic groups. We have a lot of... Um, youth full of energy doing stuff do you know how much we are losing by that not twitter if twitter can take down the account of donald trump a o number one number one sitting president not because they hate him but because he wasn't complying with the rules okay of the platform this is a platform this is not a um um, this is not, uh, this doesn't belong to Nigeria, doesn't belong to um, a national stuff. It's a platform which you need to, uh, when you are signing up, we need, to read, we need to read those fine prints, okay? So thinking that you can do anything online um, because um, you have the power, everything, no. So because of the um, um, 
of the rules and the um, regulation of the platform. They, they took it down. And the government thinking that, why? I mean, that um, Twitter is coming in between what is happening in Nigeria, okay, that and they're undermining the federal government. So what I, what I said is that um, I think um, my government needs to be proactive. They need to um, they need to see. Do you know what? See, government leverage on newspaper, radio, TV, you know, those days, those days are gone. Now the new technology that we have is not being managed by one person. We, the people that use the platform, we contribute the ingredient of that. So it's a, it's a demanding factor, okay? I want my voice to be heard. I go on Twitter, okay? So because it's a demanding factor now, government can't control it, you know? It's something, it's, a, it's not supply factor. It's not something that you force on people. It's a demanding factor that I want to be there is my choice. So they need to understand that we have moved from that era where you just control everything. People, that's why we are talking about decentralization. Okay? Now, people are afraid to even put their money in bank now. Okay? People are put, because if you can wake up and ban Twitter, it means that you can wake up one day and ban, you know, it happens February. I know a couple of friends that they, they close down their account because they have something to do with cryptocurrency and the rest. And um, I'll tell people, See, <laughs> um, I'm for decentralization. Everything about me is decentralization. My money, my resources, it's just on DeFi. So um, I'm with the government. I'm, 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 I'm with the government in terms of an how I can make them to see what is possible with blockchain, with cryptocurrency, and to add value to the nation, you know, as a country. So we keep advising them. And um, hopefully, um, very soon, um, I, I believe they will leverage on those advice and to transform the nation for good. Hmm. So, um, while we are rounding up, we have three minutes left. So, um, um, generally, what do you think is the future of um, cryptocurrency in the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? Um, just one minute. So, I will start from... Um, anyone can can start. Wow, well, I think it's. Uh, I think over the next ten years, we're going to see um, a reduction in the amount of cryptocurrencies that are out there. I mean, there's two hundred two thousand plus cryptocurrencies. You know, I, I think as time goes, uh, the the leaders in the industry will continue to grow, and other ones will fall off. Um, I think there's quite a few that are just sort of riding the hype, but don't really have a lot of substance behind it. Um, but I think with uh, the frustration that um, uh, different uh, taxpayers have in different countries with government misspending, uh, inflation, these kinds of things will cause more people to um, choose cryptocurrency as a, as a store of value. Um, and and therefore, I think that we'll continue to see a, a rise and a climb in price. Um, you know, I think in our in our lifetime, uh, we could see Bitcoin hitting a million dollars, and it's been talked about now for a number of years that a uh, million dollars a coin. Um, so, uh, I think it, the, the, all of this was a movement that we've known for since two thousand and nine. Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, um, reason behind bringing this out, and uh, and I think that that movement will continue to resonate as time goes. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Um, Dave, in just thirty seconds, what do you say the future of cryptocurrency? Every country will issue their own digital currency within less than ten years. Hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow. So we've come to the end of this. Um, um, panel, the exciting click of the cryptocurrency, and I want to thank everyone um, that have joined to contribute to this. Um, I think, like you said, in a few years down the line, um, we see a lot, a lot of nations using their own cryptocurrency. That's for good. That's good news. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Um, thank you, Lance, for joining me on this session. Thank you Thanks, so much. David. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, guys. Yeah. Okay. Bye.